Capital. Service workers in New York City. The board explained on those two occasions that the reason they were granting the increases was that the workers in those cases had not received any increase in pay since before January 1st of last year, and the board felt they were entitled to an increase to make up for the 15% rise in the cost of living since that time. The implication of the policy was that the rulings was that if the workers had received enough of an increase, counteract that increase in the cost of living since January 1st, 1941, they were not entitled to anything more. But it was only an implication. That is, it was only an implication until this afternoon when the board ruled on a wage increase demand by some 2,750 workers of the General Cable Company at Bayonne and Perth Amboy, New, New Jersey. The finding was that those workers have received adequate pay increases during that period and that therefore the workers are not entitled to anything more, which of course finishes the official establishment of this policy on the record by means of decisions. There was one vitally important and interesting sidelight of that decision too, a sentence that was sort of tossed in, apparently by way of an answer to the argument of Mr. Leon Henderson, who, as you know, has been uh, disapproving, frowning on any of these wage increases, regardless of whether the workers have or have received a boost in pay in the last year and a half. I told you about that point of view by Mr. Henderson on Monday evening. This one little sentence that was tossed into the decision today said that the total cost of this policy of the board, if it is carried out for all workers of the nation alike, will be only one and one half percent of the total payroll of the nation. The tacit suggestion being that that is not going to do much damage in the way of causing inflation. Mr. Henderson says, you know, that any... the appointment of this scientific research committee or individual by the end of this week. 
Now about Mr. Henry J. Kaiser and his program to use his shipbuilding facilities on the Pacific coast for the production of huge new cargo airplanes. A great deal has happened today. As I told you last week, there was a great deal of skepticism about that program when Mr. Kaiser came to Washington last Thursday. There were those, and many of them, who said that it would be impossible to get engines for the planes. It would be impossible to get aluminum or the necessary steel. There was definite sales resistance, if you will, in many, many, almost all quarters. Since that time, Mr. Kaiser has been taking those points in a calm, quiet way. He's a most mild-mannered individual for one who has done all that he has done. Uh, he answered them one at a time with facts and figures, quietly. And to those of us who have been watching the proceedings, it's been almost fascinating to see the weakening of that sales resistance First here, then in some other quarter. The War Production Board experts, the Navy Department experts, the Secretary of War Patterson, where they started with an ag antagonistic a attitude, they said they melted a bit first, then they said they'd look into it. Now most of those attitudes are definitely on the favorable side, as you'll see by some very important and exclusive news, which I'll give you in just a moment. The fact is that Mr. Kaiser has deeply impressed Washington by the very simple medium of having all the answers to all the problems before he ever set foot here. You may have heard him last night on this program say that if we haven't enough steel, we'll make steel. If we haven't enough nickel or chrome, we'll get that somehow. The problems ought to be solved, and the side that does solve them is the side that wins the war. On the other hand, it certainly is to the undying credit of those Navy and Maritime Commission and Army and War Production Board officials who started in with their sales resistance that they did not allow stubborn, hide-bound tradition to warp their judgment. It takes honest thinking, believe me, to toss overboard in three or four days the ingrained training and teaching and theories of old-line officers and old-line Navy training that has been ingrained for 30 years and to accept just willy-nilly in three or four days a brand new, totally revolutionary idea. I think the reason for Mr. Kaiser's success here is that while he might be listed as all that, all that claim about we would make steel if we didn't have it, we'd produce the nickel and chrome, that might be listed as mere empty talk for most people. But Mr. Kaiser has a record that proves that he has solved that sort of problem time and time again in the past. There's one incident I think you'd be interested in, in the construction of the huge Shasta Dam on the West Coast. When he had the problem of providing 10 million tons of sand and gravel for the concrete work on that dam, and the only available sand and gravel deposit for him with, with which he could do the job uh, was a deposit 10 miles away from the dam site across a range of mountains. The railroad from the gravel pits went only as far as the town of Redding, which was still a mile and a half from the dam site, and the railroad refused to build the additional mile and a half of track because... They said that the river frequently went on a rampage and was likely to tear up the track as fast as they put it down. The way Mr. Kaiser solved that, apparently...
Broadcasting system.